Okay, we got some tools, got some old bike parts, a rock shock, and a vintage frame. Looks like we got a bike project. Let's do this. How many of you remember your very first mountain bike? My first mountain bike was a Huffy Mount Storm. That thing was awesome and semi-indestructible. My second mountain bike, the first one I ever bought from a store, was a 1994 GT Rebound. I believe I paid $369 for it on sale. It had rock shocks with about 40 millimeters of travel, a Sarah shifting, and bullhorn bar ends and it was at least two sizes too small. Then, after working at my first bike shop, I bought a Trek 7000. That thing was awesome. It had Shimano V-brakes, double wall rims, a solid STX RC drivetrain, and I rode the heck out of it. But in 1999, fresh into college, the bike I really wanted to get was a racing bike, a Trek 8500, this thing had a front disc brake, icon cranks, a rock shock suspension seat post, and 100 millimeters of travel. This thing was awesome. It's been more than 20 years since that bike came out, and I've had a few bikes in between then. So when I came across this bike, I knew I had to get it. So join me for a trip down memory lane as we fix up this old bike and give it a few updates in 2021. So a common misconception is that higher-end mountain bikes tended to have all stainless steel bolts and that everything else that was aluminum couldn't corrode. But as you see, even on a higher-end seat post, if they decided to go cheap with the bolts, you could have rust on galvanized parts. Even a higher-end Shimano bottom bracket has steel sleeves that can rust over time. So it's important whenever you work on an older bike like this to look for parts that are corroded and replace them. Years ago, when I first got into mountain biking, it was a sense of adventure. We were doing things that most of our friends had never tried. There were so many unknown trails and places yet to be explored. Far away places like Moab, Utah, Fruta, Colorado, and St. George were places people would only heard about in magazines. We had no idea how good we had it in Southeast Idaho. Places like City Creek and Kelly's Canyon we really had the place to ourselves. But more than that, it was a sense of friendship and hanging out with good buddies that made that part of my youth so much fun. That sense of adventure is what I think of when I see an older mountain bike. So one thing that has changed is that we're no longer concerned about the weight of a bicycle. Even if you weren't a cross-country racer, people spent a lot of time and money trying to get their bike below 22 pounds. Most frames were easily down to three and a half or four pounds if it was aluminum, and this super light tipped the scale at three and a half pounds. This original Judy Hydra coil with 100 millimeters of travel weighs over three and a half pounds, and that's after the seal's gone bad and all the fluid is empty. If you compare that to a 2008 Reba SL, with 120 millimeters of travel, it comes in at just three and a half pounds. It's amazing how far suspension has come. The original fork is worth saving, but since I want to turn this into more of a modern trail bike, I'll be using this on another project. An interesting quirk about this frame set was the first attempts of trying to put in a chainstay mounted disc brake. This 22 millimeter offset spacing was used by Trek, Gary Fisher, and Klein, and was only designed for a specific Hayes brand disc brake. While it is possible to find a third party adapter for it, you do have to use a very narrow disc brake caliper. 
So for this bike project, since I'm working on a budget, I'll be running a V-brake, and I'll be using a number of used parts and about $150 of new parts. One of the advantages of looking back 20 years is that you know which bicycle components held up and which ones didn't. For example, this Cane Creek S3 headset is bomb proof. It was one of the first sealed cartridge bearing headsets. And for the money, these things really held up. Surprisingly, you can still find replacement bearings for these readily on eBay. As far as the rest of the bike, modern geometry has a shorter stem, wider bars, and a simplified one-by-drive train that makes shifting and operating the bike that much quicker and easier. While this bike did need a lot of modifications, just shortening up the stem two centimeters, raising up the fork, makes this into a much more comfortable ride. For the front end, I'll be running Hayes V-brake levers with a mechanical disc brake and an Avid rear V-brake. It won't have nearly the stopping power of hydraulic disc brakes, but still pretty good for what it is. The drivetrain will be a modern Tram GX 11 speed with 11 to 42 tooth cogs in the back. Older 8 and 9 speed free hub wheels can easily run 10 and 11 speed cassettes. You just have to check the compatibility of the Shimano free hub.
Something this last year has taught me is the value of holding on to positive memories and keeping friendships alive. And while this is just a video about making a bike, I think there's a lot of life lessons we could pick up from the experience of waiting on something we really wanted. 20 years later, this bike is still pretty sweet. But really, what it means to me is more of a memory. A memory of the early days of mountain biking and a reason to keep connecting with good friends. You never know when the time you have with your friends may be cut short. So, don't wait to make memories. Get out and ride more. Live an adventure and keep up with your friends. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.